Good morning. Such a white morning, huh? I have a number of announcements for you today. Um, confirmation Youth Lock-In will be the weekend of the 10th of February. And what we need from you is some people who are interested in helping bake cookies on Saturday afternoon. And if any of those interested would have a nice big mixer, that would be very helpful since uh, neither Myrna nor I have one. And we thought it would be helpful to be able to mix the cookies with the mixer. So if anyone is interested in helping bake cookies on the 11th of February in the afternoon, please uh, let me know. Um, <clears throat> I just learned about a week ago that this congregation often has a Super Bowl party. And if it, I know our Vikings are out of it, but if anyone is interested in doing that, we can put that together. That would mean that somebody would need to step up to make soup or whatever you want to serve. And we've got a good television in the fellowship room, so uh, we could certainly do that if somebody is interested. Uh, for Lent, I have had a couple people volunteer to read. I could use a couple people more for that. It's not hard. Um, what you need to say is prepared, so all it involves is reading for the message for those services. And we're going to um, be very casual during Lent, so it will not be intimidating at all. So if anyone is interested in reading for Lent, let me know. Also, we need um, people to step up if we want to have soup suppers. And, um, you know, like I said at council, if what you can do is to get a big can of soup and warm it up with some crackers or some bread, that would be fine. Daryl Osleben uh, volunteered to make homemade soup. <laughs> He's laughing. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, just thought I'd mention that, just in case you had decided. But anyone who is interested in doing that, also let me know if we don't have volunteers we will not do the soup supper, so that's the way it stands. Um, if anyone in the congregation knows of any children, first grade or above, who have not had first communion instruction um, and would like to have that so that they can share in communion, um, I will put a class together so that we can do that before Easter. So do let me know also there. I am not aware of all the kids in the congregation. I was thinking this morning as you walked in, I'm starting to think of your names when you come into church. So I've been here a while and I'm starting to know everybody. So that's a good thing. Is there anything else that I might have missed? Um, if the board of stewardship could be in the back of church today after the service. Okay, board of stewardship right after church in the back of the church. Then let us begin with the confession and forgiveness. It's this Advent, but we are in Epiphany. Please rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who makes all things new, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin. Holy One, source of our renewal, 
we confess that we are wrapped up in sin and cannot free ourselves. We have not practiced your righteousness. Our hearts have turned away from you. For the sake of the world you so love, forgive us that we may be reconciled to one another. For the glory of your holy name, amen. Thus says our God, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. God's mercy makes us new. We are forgiven in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Let us sing our entrance hymn. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you we praise you for your glory, Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on 
Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, your loving kindness always goes before us and follows after us. Summon us into your light and direct our steps in the ways of goodness that come through the cross of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading today is from the book of Isaiah. The northern tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali experienced the gloom of defeat by Assyrian military forces, but they are assured that their condition will be reversed when God makes a light-filled appearance. The joy they will experience will resemble celebrations of great harvests because God will deliver them from everything that diminishes or oppresses them. The text begins. There will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time, the Lord brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. Word of God, word of life. Our psalm today is Psalm 27. We'll read it responsibly. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? For in the day of trouble, God will give me shelter, hide me in the hidden places of the sanctuary, and raise me high upon a rock. Even now my head is lifted up above my enemies who surround me. Therefore I will offer sacrifice in the sanctuary, sacrifices of rejoicing I will sing and music to the Lord. Hear my voice, O Lord, when I call. Have mercy on me and answer me. My heart speaks your message. Seek my face. Your face, O Lord, I will see. Hide not your face from me. Turn not away from your servant in anger. Cast me not away. You have always been my helper. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. Our second reading today is from 1 Corinthians. Paul calls on the Corinthians to end their dissensions and share the unified outlook of the gospel. Discord arises when we forget that we belong not to human leaders or institutions, but to Christ. Indeed, the unifying word of the cross of Christ is the center of the gospel and the power of God's salvation. Text begins. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? 
Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Word of God, word of life. The Gospel is found in the Gospel of Matthew, the fourth chapter, beginning with the twelfth verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. The Gospel of the Lord. You, you may be seated. You can have the children come up. We got a couple of them. A pair. You are a pair of children. One of you can be John, one of you can be James, or one of you can be Simon, and one of you can be Andrew, the disciples. Do you know what it means to be a disciple? To follow the ways of Jesus. What are some of the ways of Jesus? What are some of the ways that Jesus, how you, Jesus wants you to be in the world? Kind. Kind. Nice. How about helping other people? Yeah. Sometimes telling somebody about Jesus who hasn't heard about Jesus. Yeah, there are lots of ways. Sometimes being a disciple is going out and helping someone. When you help someone, what do you use to help them? I'll give you a hint, some part of your body. Your hands, yes, your hands. You use your hands. We use our hands in church when we help people serve treats or the organist or the pianist plays p piano or organ with their hands. The ushers pass out the bulletins with their hands. When you're at home, how can you be a good disciple? 
help your parents, yes. And in order to do that, you have to use your hands, don't you? Dinner. Help them make dinner. Do any of you ever have to load the dishwasher or unload the dishwasher or wash the dishes? No? If you want to, oh. <laughs> and since you're a good disciple, you will want to, right? Yeah, yeah, I could use you at my house to be a disciple. You could even feed my cat, Molly. She'd probably learn to like you, <laughs> you if, especially if you pet her. Or like Bobby, if you play organ, because my cat loves organ music and whatever. Uh, whenever I play on the YouTube, the service, she's swishing across my face to the organ music. She's telling me she likes it. So we can be a good disciple with our voices and with our bodies and with our hands. Today I'm going to give you a little exercise in coloring. And as you color it, you will figure out how to use your body to be a good disciple of Jesus. She's looking. <laughs> and I'm trying to get the paper apart. There you go. Thanks for coming up. I think a little drink before I start here would be helpful. The air is dry in here, so. When I think back on the past almost eight months that I've been with you, can you believe that, almost eight months? I think of the remarkable job you have all done to keep this congregation going. Various tasks have needed to be done. Organizational matters, paperwork that needed to be attended to, um, all kinds of things. And so many of you have pitched in to make it work. I didn't know when I came if you would be open and willing to doing that um, because I had heard that a lot had kind of been done for you. But as I was coming out just for pulpit supply, the only way that this congregation could survive and move forward if all of you stepped up to make that happen. And I saw that happen. The Spirit of God has been alive and well in this community. The Spirit of God has been continuing to shape it and mold it in what God wants this community to be. There's not a whole lot I can say about the scripture today that you don't already know. Jesus is calling the disciples and contrary to the book of John, in Matthew, the, the disciples get up and leave immediately. In fact, the word immediately is one of Matthew's favorite words. But Jesus can't do his mission alone. He needs other people to help him. And that's why also today, at Zion and in this community, God, Jesus needs all of you to help him. Jesus makes the announcement in today's gospel that the time is now. The kingdom is now. The Jews thought that the kingdom of God was coming at the end of time. They didn't have any idea that the kingdom was as they lived on the earth. But Jesus says that the kingdom is now. 
How can we make the kingdom of God known today, in this time, in January in Arlington, Minnesota? That is the task that Jesus sets before us as Jesus' disciples. The kingdom of God was a vision at creation, and the kingdom of God comes to culmination at the end of time. But we bring the kingdom of God here and now, in this place at Zion, in this community in Arlington, and all throughout the world. You make that known partly by your offerings and your gifts to the food, uh, food jar, the hunger jar, but also through your actions in this community, your service to others. Maybe you serve on other boards and committees. Maybe you volunteer to do the birthday party at the nursing home. All these are ways that we are disciples in the here and now, and ways that we bring the kingdom of God right here, right now. It's not something we wait for at the end of time, but something we begin to create as we serve Jesus. The kingdom is here and now in this sanctuary among all of you who are followers of Jesus. There are two Greek words used for the word time. When, when you think of time, what do you think of? What automatically comes to mind? A clock, yeah, a clock. We're used to what the Greek, uh, Greeks use as chronos time. Time that is limited to minutes and hours and days and weeks and months and years. That's what we think of when we talk about time. But in the Greek, there's also another word for time, kairos. Have any of you heard of that, kairos time? It's that moment when God breaks into your life and you kind of lose track of the chronos time, even if it's for a short period of time, where God's kingdom is powerful in you. As a pastor, we often have training sessions that are called kairos. And the intent is that we go to these and we let all the concerns and worries of the parish behind and just immerse ourselves in the learning experience. For you, Kairos may be just that moment that God touches you so deeply that you almost feel like you're moved to tears or, or you feel like, I am so thankful for my family, for my life. I am so thankful that I have Jesus to protect and guide me. God's time, it's that particular moment when we're touched by God in some special way. Sometimes it happens when we're grieving. All of a sudden we're very aware that our loved one is in God's care. And that might bring tears of joy. In this passage, Jesus is calling his disciples. When you hear the word call, what do you think of? Do you ever think of yourself being called? Each one of you is called, each in your own way. It might be some small service. It might be some big service. Some are, of you are called to bake treats, to make coffee. Some are called to rewrite the Constitution. Some are called to go out and visit those who are ailing in some way. 
Some are called to organize a program that's going to happen at church. At this time, I'm hoping some of you are called to make soup suppers or to read in the Lenten services. There are all kinds of ways to be called. And I want to share with you the verse that was in my head as I was called to ministry. And it's from Isaiah 42, verses 4, 3 and 4. I have called you by name. Do you believe that Jesus calls you by name? I have taken you by the hand and kept you. Can you imagine yourselves holding Jesus' hand and moving through your lives? To give sight to the blind, to release the prisoner from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. Those were the words that were in my mind. I have called you by name. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. Now go out and share that with the people that you meet in your life. And you all are tasks with that kind of call in whatever way God leads you. To do. Richard Niebuhr was a theologian, pastor, seminary professor, and he talks about four categories of, fall, of call, and I hope you find yourself in one of these, and you will. First of all is the common call, the sense that we are all grafted into Christ through the Holy Spirit. We all have a common call by virtue of our baptisms that we are to do ministry in some way, that we are to make Christ known in some way. It may be by shoveling the sidewalks outside of the church so people can get in safely. That is a call. Then there's a providential call. And that has to do with our talents and abilities. As I look out on you, I see all kinds of different talents. You are given these talents to serve as Jesus' disciples. Some of you are musical. Some of you read well. Some of you bake well. Some of you organize well all the different ways that we serve. God provides all these talents so all the tasks of ministry are taken care of. You know, as Paul says, there are all different parts of the body but one spirit. We are all different parts of providential talents serving one Jesus Christ one God. Then there's the secret call. And I would say that that is the kind of call that I had when I was called into the service of word and sacrament. That private, personal moment, that kairos moment, when God's need and our willingness meet sort of an, in an electric moment of commitment. And then, of course, there's the ecclesiastical call, which is the call to word and sacrament, or as a deacon or deaconess in the church. Richard Niebuhr makes it clear that no one call is more important than any other call. Your call to take care of the furnace of this building is as important as my call to stand here and talk to you every week. 
your call to lead the Bible study at Circle or play the piano at the nursing home. Our, your call uh, is just as important as anything I might do. We all have a call, and all of those calls must lead to service in God's name. In today's story, as I said, James and John and Andrew and Simon Peter just get up out of their boats and go, at least according to Matthew. I can't help but wonder, did they have wives back home? Did they have families? Did they own these boats? Did they just walk away and let the boats float on the edge of the water and let the nets sit in them? What happened to everything else in their lives? I guess my mind goes there because that's a place where I really struggled. My decision to go into ministry didn't just affect me. It affected four other people in my family. How were they going to deal with it? What was going to happen with them? How were they going to move forward with their lives? For one thing, I knew if I left, the dairy farm would not survive. I knew that, and I struggled with that because that had been a common goal for 20 years. For another thing, I had three children in school in the Sibley East school system in three different grades, in three different school buildings, in three different towns. Remember those days? What was going to happen with my children? How would they be affected? I was earning the living for the family by teaching since the farm barely, if ever, supported itself. How were we going to live? How were we going to have groceries and all of those common necessary things we need in life just to make it through life? I had to at last, at last, accept the challenges and the risks involved. Maybe these disciples didn't get up immediately. Maybe that's the way Matthew writes. We don't know. We'll never know. But I think making them human and making us aware of the challenges they faced makes it easier for us to join in the story. It's not always convenient to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Sometimes it barges in on other aspects of our life, and we have to figure out how that's going to work out. At Zion, I have discovered in the last eight months that this is a community of leaders. There are those who are willing to follow the call, the vision, vision <coughs> to follow the prompting, prompting of the spirit to make this community survive and thrive. I see great health here. I see a congregation that is willing to work with their pastor in whatever way is needed. If I were to be able to share my perceptions with somebody interviewing for the call, that's what I would share. This is a gifted community willing to serve, and you will have fun with them because of that. You have been, you are a community of leaders that has answered God's call vigorously and creatively through time 
and place. Let each one of us commit ourselves today and in the days ahead to listen, to respond, to risk, and to follow as we continue to experience those Kairos moments in our lives at home and in our lives here together. May it be so for you and for me. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's continue with our hymn of the day. Please rise for the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we collect the offering.
Let us pray. Liberating God, you break the bonds of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Receive these offerings in thanksgiving for all your works of merciful power and shape us as people of your justice and freedom. You we magnify and adore through Jesus Christ our, our Savior. Amen. Drawn to the light of Christ, made bold in the waters of baptism, and filled with the Spirit, we lift up our prayers with confidence that God loves and listens to us. God of light, help us experience Kairos moments in our lives, times when we let go of Kronos restraints, enjoy times of worship with you, and step out in faith for the sake of this congregation, this community, and our world. Merciful God, God of light, continue to reveal to us the gifts you have given us to serve the church and the world. Let us be bold in using our talents and gifts in your service. Merciful God, God of light, shine light and warmth on those in this congregation and community who suffer illness or infirmity. Wrap your arms around the homebound that your love may fill them with wondrous warmth. Merciful God, God of light, be with all those who plow the snow and clear the ice and go to all efforts to keep our streets, roads, and sidewalks passable and safe. Give them stamina to continue their work when the wintry weather begins to wear all of us down. Merciful God, God of light, show us where you want us to answer your call, knowing no service is too big or too small for your sake. Merciful God, we bring to you our needs and hopes, O God, trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The God who faithfully brings forth justice and breaks the oppressor's rod, bless, strengthen, and uphold you today and always. Amen. Let us sing our closing hymn.
follow the way of Jesus. Have a good week. I'll read.